rooms, in which we were eventually to play a role. But, reluctantly in some cases, happily in others, most serious Christian churchmen accept the evidence of evolution. But sadly, it does not follow that their Christian congregations see things the same way. The evidence from opinion polls shows that more than 40% of Americans deny that humans evolved from other animals and think that we, by implication of all life, were created by God within the last 10,000 years. The figure for Turkey is even worse. The figure is not quite so high in Britain, but it is still worryingly high. It seems appropriate to use the name history deniers for those people who deny evolution. People who believe the world's age is measured in thousands of years rather than thousands of millions of years, and who believe humans walked with dinosaurs. Evolution is a fact. Beyond reasonable doubt, beyond serious doubt, beyond sane, informed, intelligent doubt, beyond doubt, evolution is a fact. The evidence for evolution is at least as strong as the evidence for the Holocaust, even alive to the fact that we have eyewitnesses. It is the plain proof that we are cousins of chimpanzees, slightly more distant cousins of monkeys, more distant cousins still of camels and donkeys, yet more distant cousins of bananas and cabbages. Continue the list as long as desire. Magic has to be true. It is not self evidently or intuitively true. And there was a time when most people, even educated people, thought it wasn't true. It didn't have to be true, but it is. We know this because there is a huge amount of evidence for it. Evolution is a fact. Obviously, the vast majority of evolution change is invisible to direct eyewitness observation. Most of it happened before we were born, and in any case, it is usually too slow to be seen during an individual's lifetime. The same is true of the relentless pulling apart of Africa and South America, which occurs too slowly for us to notice. With evolution, as with continental drift, inference after the event is all that is available to us, for the obvious reason that we don't exist until after the event. But do not for one nanosecond underestimate the power of such events. The slow drifting apart of South America and Africa is now an established fact in the ordinary language sense of fact. And so is our common ancestry with porcupines we are like detectives who come on the scene after a crime has been committed. The murderer's actions have vanished into the past. The detective has no hope of witnessing the actual crime with his own eyes. In any case, numerous experiments have shown that it is not always safe to trust our own eyes. What the detective does have is traces that remain, and there's a great deal to trust there. There are footprints, fingerprints, and nowadays DNA fingerprints too. Bloodstains, letters, diaries. The world is the way the world should be, with this and this history, but not that and that history, led up to the present. Creationists love the fossil record, because they have been taught by each other to repeat over and over the mantra that it is full of gaps. Show me your intermediates. They imagine that these gaps are an embarrassment. Actually, we're not going to have any fossils at all, let alone the massive number that we now do have to document evolutionary history. Large numbers put by any standards constitute beautiful intermediates. As I emphasized in my book, The Greatest Show on Earth, we don't need fossils in order to demonstrate that evolution is a fact. The evidence that evolution would be entirely secure, even if not a single corpse had ever fossilized. Evidence from the comparative study of modern species and their geographical distribution, for example. It's a bonus that we do actually have large numbers of fossils, and more are discovered every day. The fossil evidence for evolution in many major animal groups is wonderfully strong. Nevertheless, there are, of course, gaps, and creationists love them obsessively. But since the case for evolution is watertight without them, it is paradoxical to use gaps in the fossil record as though they were evidence against evolution. What would be evidence against evolution, the very strong evidence of that, would be the discovery of even a single fossil in the wrong geological structure. As the biologist 
this JBS survey, famously retorted, when asked to name an observation that would disprove the theory of evolution, fossil rabbits in the Precambria. <laughs> no authentic anachronistic fossils of any kind have ever been found. All the fossils that we have, and there are very, very many of them, occur without a single authenticated exception in the right temporal sequence. Yes, there are gaps, but there are no fossils at all, and that's only to be expected. But not a single solitary fossil has ever been found in a layer of rock that was formed before the fossil in question could have been expected to happen. That's a very telling fact, and there's no reason why we should expect it on the creation theory. A good theory is one that is capable of being disproved, yet is not disproved. Evolution could so easily be disproved if just a single fossil turns up in the wrong date order. Evolution has passed this test with flying colors. Skeptics of evolution in their case should be diligently scrabbling around in the rocks, desperately trying to find anachronistic fossils. Maybe they'll find one. Want a bet? The biggest gap, the one creationist like best of all, is the one that preceded the so-called Cambrian explosion. <laughs> Little more than half a billion years ago in the Cambrian era, most of the great animal fibre suddenly appeared in the fossil record. Suddenly, in the sense that in rocks older than the Cambrian, no fossils of these animal groups are known. It obviously wasn't suddenly in the everyday sense of the word, since the period we're talking about is at least 20 million years. It is still quite sudden. And I wrote in the Blind Watchmaker that the Cambrian shows us a substantial example of major animal phyla already in an advanced state of evolution, the very first time they appear. It's as though they were just planted there without any evolution in history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. That last sentence from the Blind Watchmaker shows that I was smart enough to realize that creationists would like it. I was not, that's in 1986, smart enough to realize that they would gleefully quote my lines back at me in their own favor, deliberately omitting my careful words of explanation. Out of curiosity, I recently Googled, it is as though they were just planted there without any evolution of history, and obtained no fewer than 473 hits. As a crude control test of the hypothesis that the majority of these hits represent creationist quote markings, I tried Googling for comparison the clause that immediately follows the above quotation in the blind rock maker. Evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record. I obtained a grand total of six hits, compared to the 473 hits for the previous sentence. Hmm. Creationists really are breathtaking. <coughs> I dealt with the Cambrian explosion at length, especially in my book, Unleashing the Rainbow. Here, I'll just add one viewpoint, illustrated by the flatworms, catechol monkeys. This great phylum of worms, including the parasitic flukes and tapeworms, which are great medical reform. My favorites are the free living turbinarian worms, in which there are more than 4,000 species. That's about as numerous as all the mammals put together. Some of these turbinarians are creatures of great beauty. They're common, both in water and on land, and presumably have been common for a very long time. So you'd expect them to have left a rich fossil history. But unfortunately, there is none. Apart from a handful of ambiguous trace fossils, not a single fossil flatworm has ever been found. All the flatworms are already in an advanced state of evolution, the very first time they have been. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolution in history. But in this case, the very first time they appear is not the Cambrian, but today. Do you see what this means, or at least ought to mean for creationists? Creationists believe that black worms were created in the same week as all other creatures. They therefore had exactly the same time in which to fossilize as all other creatures. During all the centuries when all those bony or shelly animals were depositing their fossils by the millions, the flatworms must have been living happily alongside them, but without being 
slightest trace of their presence in the rocks. What then is so special about gaps in the fossil record, given that the past history of the flatworms is one big gap? Even though the flatworms, by the creationist's own account, have existed for the same length of time. If the gap before the Cambrian explosion is used as evidence that most animals suddenly sprang into existence in the Cambrian, exactly should be used to prove that the flatworms ran into existence yesterday. But this contradicts the creationist belief that flatworms were created during the same week as everything else. They cannot have it both ways. <laughs> this argument at a stroke completely and finally destroys the creationist case that the pre-Cambrian gap in the fossil record had been taken as evidence against evolution. Why, on the evolution review, are there so few fossils before the Cambrian era? Well, presumably, whatever factors apply to the network throughout the geological time to this day, those same factors apply to the rest of the animal kingdom before the Cambrian. Probably, most animals before the Cambrian were soft bodied like modern networks. Probably rather small, like modern terpenarians, just not good fossil material. Then, something happened half a billion years ago to allow the evolution of hard, mineralized skeletons, or otherwise to allow them to fossilize freely. The earlier name for gap in the fossil record was missing link. The phrase became fashionable in England in the 19th and 20th centuries. Its original meaning, a confused one as I shall show, implied that the Darwinian theory lacked a vital link between humans and other primates. History deniers to this day are very fond of saying, but you still haven't found the missing link. They often phone and talk about built down man for good measure. Nobody knows who perpetrated the built down hoax, so there's a lot to answer for. The fact that one of the first candidates for a man ape fossil to be discovered turned out to be a hoax provided an excuse for history deniers to ignore the very numerous fossils that are not hoaxes. And they still haven't stopped noticing. Only they would look at the facts. They'd soon discover that we now have a rich supply of intermediate fossils linking modern humans to the common ancestor that we share with chimpanzees. <coughs> On the human side of the divide, that is, interestingly, there are as yet almost no fossils linking that ancestor, which was neither chimpanzee nor human, to modern chimpanzees. Perhaps this is because chimpanzees live in forests, which don't provide good fossilizing conditions. If anything, it's chimpanzees, not humans, who today have a right to be the same. <laughs> that then is one of the most missing It's the alleged gap between humans and the rest of the animal kingdom. The missing link, in that sense, is, to put it mildly, no longer missing. Another meaning concerns the alleged lack of so called transitional forms between major groups like reptiles and birds or fish and amphibians. Produce your intermediates. Evolutionists often respond to this challenge for distant flyers by throwing them the bones of Archaeopteryx, the famous intermediate between reptiles and birds. This is a mistake. Archaeopteryx is not the answer to a challenge because there is no challenge worth answering. To put up a single famous fossil like Archaeopteryx is to play by the creationist rules. In fact, for a large number of fossils, a good case that they made that every one of them is an intermediate between something and something else. The silliest of all the missing link challenges are of this kind. First, if people came from mountains by frogs and fish, then why does the fossil record not contain a frog feed? I've seen that these Islamic creationists ask why there are no crocodiles. And second, I'll believe in evolution when I see a monkey give birth to a human baby. This last one makes the same mistake as all the others, plus the additional one of thinking that major evolutionary change happens in the night. Well, of course, monkeys are not descended from frogs. No sane evolutionist ever said they were, nor that ducks are descended from crocodiles or vice versa. Monkeys and frogs share an ancestor who certainly looked nothing like a frog and nothing like a monkey. Maybe it looked a bit like a salamander, and we do indeed have salamander-like fossils dating from the right time. But that's not the point. Every one of the billions of 
species of animals shares an ancestor with every other one. If your understanding of evolution is so confused that you think we should expect to see a frog and a crocodile, you should also comment sarcastically about the absence of a doggy bottom and an elephant leaf. Indeed, why limit yourself to mammals? Why not an octopus? <laughs> There's an infinite number of animal names you can scrape together in that way. Of course, the hippopotamuses are not descended from dogs or vice versa. Chimpanzees are not descended from elephants or vice versa. And monkeys are not descended from dogs. No modern species is descended from any other modern species. We do not have any Just as you could find fossils that approximate to the common ancestor of a frog and a monkey, so you can find fossils that approximate to the common ancestor of elephants and chimpanzees. There's a fossil called Eo Maya, which lived in the early Cretaceous period, a little more than a hundred million years ago. Eo Maya looked nothing like a chimpanzee and nothing like an elephant. Vaguely like a shrew, it probably was pretty similar to their common ancestor, which it was with which it is roughly contemporary. It is obvious that a lot of evolutionary change has taken place along both pathways, from a Eomaya-like ancestor to an elephant descendant, and from the same Eomaya-like ancestor to a chimpanzee descendant. But it's not in any sense an elephant. If it were, it would also have to be a doggerty, or whatever is the common ancestor of a chimpanzee and an elephant is also the common ancestor of a dog and a manatee. The very idea of a doggerty, or an elephant or any other combination, is deeply unevolutionary and ridiculous. An equally ludicrous example is to be found in the Muslim apologist Harry Yahya's enormous, lavishly produced, glossily illustrated, and childishly ignorant book, Atlas of Creation. This book obviously cost a fortune for produce, which makes it all the more astounding. It was distributed freely to tens of thousands of <laughs> Despite the enormous sums of money spent on this book, the errors of it have become legend. In the service of illustrating the false claim that most ancient fossils are indistinguishable from their modern counterparts, it shows a sea snake as an eel. In reality, they are so different that they are placed in different classes of vertebrates. It shows a starfish as a brittle star. In reality, different classes of echinoderms. A surveyed analytic worm as a crinoid sea lily. Echinoderm. This pair come not just from different phyla, but from different subkingdoms. They could hardly be more distant from each other if they tried, while still both being animals. <laughs> a man made fishing girl as a caddis fly. But in addition to these gems of comical bias, the book has a section on missing limbs. There's a picture of a fictitious animal, half fish and half starfish, which is seriously offered to illustrate the fact that there is no intermediate form between a fish and a starfish. It is very hard to believe that the author seriously thinks evolution is to expect to find a transition between two such different animals a starfish and a fish. As for the creationist cry of, I'll believe in evolution when a monkey gives birth to a human baby, once again, humans are not descended from monkeys. We share a common ancestor with monkeys. As it happens, the common ancestor would have looked a lot more like a monkey than a human, and he would indeed probably have been called a monkey if we'd met in some place five million years ago. But even though humans evolved from an ancestor that we could sensibly call a monkey, no animal gives birth to an instant new species, or at least not one as different from itself as a human is from a monkey. That isn't what evolution is about. Evolution is not only a gradual process of a matter of fact, it has to be gradual if it is to do any explanatory work. Huge leaps in a single generation is what a monkey to be birth to a human would be, are almost as unlikely as divine creation, and a rule out of the same reason, too statistically improbable. It would be so nice if those who oppose evolution would take a tiny bit of trouble and 
to learn the mere significance of what it is they are opposing. We're used to the idea that living creatures seem to be well designed. In some respects, evolution is a good one. The vertebrate eye at its best, maybe it's ever hawk or a human, is a superb precision instrument capable of feats of fine resolution to rival the best that designs for Nikon and deliver. We know this if only because if it were not so, Zeiss and Nikon would be wasting their time producing high resolution images for our eyes to look at. On the other hand, the great 19th century German scientist Hermann von Helmholtz said of the eye, if an optician tried to sell me an instrument this faulty, I would feel entirely justified in describing the shoddiness of his work in the harshest terms and sending his instrument back with a protest. One reason the eye seems better than Helmholtz judged it to be is that the brain does an amazing job cleaning the images up afterwards, like a sort of ultra sophisticated automatic Photoshop. As far as optics, you and I achieved its nice Nikon quality only in the phobia, the central part of the retina, that we use for reading. When we scan the scene, we move the phobia over different parts, seeing each one in the utmost detail and precision, and the brain's Photoshop fools us into thinking we're seeing the whole scene with the same precision. The top quality Zeiss or Nikon lens really does show the whole scene with equal clarity. <coughs> So, what the eye lacks in optics, the brain makes up for with its sophisticated image simulating software. But I haven't yet mentioned the most glaring example of imperfections in the optics. Yes, you have back to the front. Imagine that an engineer had presented Helmholtz with a large matrix of tiny photocells set up to capture images projected directly onto the surface of the matrix, which we can call the resonance. That makes good sense. And obviously, each photocell has a wire connecting it to a computing device of some kind, where images are put together. Makes sense again. How no, no, would it send it back? But now, suppose I tell you that the photocells are pointing backwards, away from the scene being looked at. The wires connecting the photocells to the brain run all over the surface of the retina, so the light rays have to pass through a carpet of massed wires before they hit the photocell. That doesn't make sense. It gets even worse. One consequence of the photocell pointing backwards is that the wires that carry their data somehow have to pass through the retina and back to the brain. In the vertebrate eye, they achieve this by all converging on a particular hole in the retina where they dive through it. This hole in <coughs> nerves is called the blind spot because it is but spot is too flattering, so it's quite large, more like a blind patch, which again doesn't actually inconvenience as much because of the automatic Photoshop software in the brain. Once again, send it back. It's not just bad design, it's the design of a complete idiot. It isn't. If it were, the eye would be terrible at seeing what it is not. It's actually very good. It's good because natural selection came along after the big original error of restoring the retina backwards and tidied up countless little details, restoring it to a high quality precision instrument. It reminds me of the saga of the Hubble Space Telescope. You remember that when it was launched in 1990, the Hubble was discovered to possess a major flaw. Owing to an undetected fault in the calibration apparatus when it was being ground and polished, the main mirror was slightly but seriously out of shape. The telescope was launched into orbit and then discovered to be defective. In a daring and resourceful move, astronauts were sent off to the telescope and they succeeded in fitting it to what you might think of as spectacles. After that, the telescope worked very well and further improvements were made during three more servicing missions. The point I'm making is that a major design flaw, a catastrophic blunder even, can be corrected by subsequent tinkering. And the ingenuity and intricacy of this tinkering can, under the right circumstances, perfectly compensate for the initial error. In evolution generally, major mutations, even if they cause improvements in generally the right direction, almost always require a lot of subsequent tinkering. A tidying up approach by lots of small mutations that come along later and are favored by selection because they smooth out the rough edges left by the initial large mutation. This is why humans and hawks see so well by the blundering flaw in the initial design.
this practice of later design flaws compensated by subsequent tinkering is exactly what we should not expect if there really was a designer at work. You might expect unfortunate mistakes, as in the spherical error of the Hubble mirror, but we do not expect obvious stupidity, as in the rest of being installed back to front. Blunders of this kind come not from poor design, but from history. One of my favorite examples is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It is a branch of one of the cranial nerves. Those nerves would be directly from the brain rather than from the spinal cord. One of the cranial nerves, the venous, has various branches, two of which go to the heart and two to the larynx, the voice box in that way. On each side of the neck, one of the branches of the laryngeal nerve goes to the larynx, following a direct route such as the designer might have chosen. The other one goes to the larynx by an astonishing, an astonishing detail. It dives right down into the chest, loops around one of the main arteries, leading the heart, and then heads back up the neck to its destination. If you think of it as design, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a disgrace. No one told you to have even more cause to send it back to the eye. But, as with the eye, it makes perfect sense the moment you forget design and think history instead. Back when our ancestors were fish, the nerve that we now call the recurrent laryngeal took the most direct route to what was then its end organ, which was behind the very same artery which is now in the chest. During the evolution the mammals, however, the neck stretched, which don't have necks. As the ancestors of mammals evolved further and further away from their fish ancestors, nerves and blood vessels found themselves pulled and stretched and puzzling the retinas, which distorted the spaces between them. And the recurrent laryngeal nerves became more than ordinary exaggerated casualties of this distortion. In a person, a detour taken by the recurrent laryngeal represents a detour of several centimeters. But in a direct way, it well beyond the joke. A detour of perhaps 4.5 meters in a large adult giraffe. Many of us suffer from that. And the reason, yet again, lies in our evolutionary history. For hundreds of millions of years, our ancestors walked with the backbone of the horizontal. It doesn't take kindly to the sudden readjustment proposed by the last few million years. The point once again, it was a real designer of an upright walking primate would have gone back to the drawing board and done the job properly, instead of starting with a quadruped antique. Another example of an out-of-date animal concerns the pouch of that lovely Australian marsupial, the koala, which, not a great idea if an animal that spends its time clinging to tree trunks, opens downwards instead of upwards as in a kangaroo. Once again, the reason is a legacy of history. Koalas are descended from a wombat-like ancestor. Wombats are champion diggers. The Australian science writer Robin Williams describes them as flinging great paws full of soil backwards like an excavator digging out a tunnel. Had this ancestor's pouch pointed forwards, his babies would have had eyes and teeth permanently filled with grit. So backwards it was, and when one day the creature moved up a tree, perhaps to exploit a fresh food source, the design came with it, too complicated to change. The end of the quote from Robin Williams. As with the recurrent laryngeal, it might theoretically be possible to change the embryology of the koala to turn its pouch the other way up. But, I'm guessing, the embryological upheaval that would accompany such a major change would leave the intermediates even worse off than the existing state of affairs. Evolution is an inescapable fact. And we should celebrate its astonishing power, simplicity, and beauty. Evolution is within us, around us, and between us, and its workings are embedded in the rocks of past ages. In this short lecture, I haven't even mentioned two of the most powerful kinds of evidence, the evidence from geographical distribution and the evidence from comparative genetics. To return to our metaphor of the detective piecing the crime together after the event, the evidence for evolution is far more convincing, far more incontrovertible than any I 
any district court that had ever been used in any court of law, in any century to establish guilt in any crime, proof beyond reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt, that is the understatement of all time. And all time, as the geological evidence shows, is a very, very long time. Arkadaşlar soru yazılı olarak iletmek isteyenler varsa birkaç önümüzdeki birkaç dakika içinde toplayabiliriz ama çok fazla bir şey yapamayacağız. Sure that they do. Uh, I said that many Christian leaders do that, and um, they seem to have no problem with it. I actually do find a rather uh, strong compatibility between evolution and, and religion, but many churches don't. Um, in my view, the compatibility lies in the fact that what evolution is explained is the existence of complicated things like us. Now, any kind of God would have to be a very complicated thing. And therefore, he would have to come into existence by some process. And since we've got a process in evolution to explain how complicated we come into existence, that's sort of totally unnecessary undermining to postulate a complicated design on top of that. So I think it's at best in purpose, and at worst is possibly contradictory. Sonunu kısaca çevirmeye çalıştım, ben de başlığını takip etmiyordum. Ee, Evrim e, Malaman karmaşıklığı çok etkili bir şekilde açıklıyor. Dolayısıyla aklım bir açıklamaya e, gerek yok dedi. E, eğer e, din e, evrimde bir sorun yoksa bunda bir sorun yok e, diye dedim. Bir şey e, Kusura bakmayın, e, bir dahaki sorular daha dikkatli olacağız. Evet, burada şimdi evet, e, Mahir Hoca'nın e, çevirisini tekrar diyorum. Evrim dediğim e, çok az anlaşabileceğimi düşünmüyorum diye de ekliyorum. Anlaşabileceğim, evet anlaşabileceklerini düşünmüyorum. Yani anlaşmayacaklarını düşünüyorum demiş. Kusura bakmayın tekrar bu hatta hiç.
this is of great medical importance because um, in the few decades since antibiotics were invented, starting with penicillin, that bacteria have very efficiently evolved resistance to each antibiotic that we can throw out. This is a most dramatic and highly important demonstration of evolution by natural selection happening before our very eyes. There are other examples. Um, there are examples with some lizards, for example, in Mediterranean islands, where we've seen evolution happen over a period of about 30 years. There's some suggestion that um, African elephants are evolving shorter and shorter tusks as natural selection from poachers, um, choosing the ones with the largest tusks and the ones with the largest tusks. So there are some examples where we can actually see evolution by natural selection in the laboratory. But mostly evolution of an interesting kind happened in the past. And we have to infer it indirectly by looking at the traces that we made by the detecting those from the past. Elbette e, laboratuvarda da evrim gözlemlerini biliyor ama tabii bu az olarak e, nesiller arası e, sürenin kısa olduğu türlerde gözlemlenebiliyor. E, örneğin bakteriler gibi e, bir nesilden yeni bir nesile geçişin e, dakikalarla ölçüldü. İnsan gibi e, nesiller arası sürenin on yıldır bulduğu türlerde ise bunu gözlemlememiz çok daha zor. Ama e, bakteri ve kısa sürede çoğalan organizmalarda çok sayıda evrimsel deney e, yapıldı ve çeşitli biyokimyasal e, koşullara laboratuvarda nasıl uyum sağladıkları e, gözlendi. Bunun e, önemli tıbbi açıdan önem e, taşıyan örneklerinden bir tanesi de e, bakterilerin antibiyotiklere e, direnç e, geliştirmeleri. E, bunun örneklerini de e, son e, yarım yüzyıldır e, sürekli görüyoruz. E, Tatlı edilen antibiyotiklerin neredeyse hepsine bakteriler e, direnç geliştirmeyi, e, direnç Başardılar. Ayrıca bunun başka örnekleri de var. Ee, örneğin e, Afrika fillerinde e, daha kısa fil dişlerinin evlenmekte olduğu, çünkü uzun fil dişlerinin e, bireyler arası e, mücadelede e, zarar, e, kendilerine zarar getirdiği e, düşünülüyor. Dolayısıyla kısa fil dişlerinin kısalmasına yönelik bir evlisel baskı olduğu görülüyor. Elbette ki en ilginç ve karmaşık evlisel uyarlanımlar çok uzun zaman oluyor. Dolayısıyla bunları zaman e, kendi yaşam bilimimiz için de gözlemleyemiyoruz. Ama e, bunun örnekleri de var. Aa, pardon. E, sorun <gülüyor> orijinalini e, size aktarmadım. Soru şuydu. E, evlisel değişimin çoğunu kendi yaşam süremiz içinde gözlemleyemeyeceğimizi söylemişti. Peki bunun örnekleri var mı? E, sorunun kendisi. Thank you. 
Soru şuydu, insanlar doğal seçilme veya evrim doğasını farklı türleri yok ederek nasıl etkiliyorlar? Dokuz da şunu söyledi, bir defa hayvanların dağılımına insanların dünyayı kolonizasyonunun çok büyük etkisi olduğuna doğruladı. Ancak şunu da hatırlattı, birçok hayvanın soyu tükenirken birçok canlı ise öte yandan yeni koşullara uyarlanım sağlıyor. Buna örnek olarak da Londra metrosunda yeni koşullara uyarlanım sağlamış gözüken bir sivrisinek grubunu hatırlattı. Bunlar fiilen türleşmiş bile olabilirler bu metro koşulları altında. Sonuçta insanların şu anda çevreleri üzerinde çok çok dramatik bir etkileri var ve bu ileride evrimsel bir katastrof olarak değerlendirilebilir. Daha fazla soru al, alamıyoruz arkadaşlar. Şu anda elimizdeki sorular bile e, çok e, yüksek bir sayıda. Bir soru daha e, geçebilirim. Soru da şöyle. E, bilinmeye yani ilmime inanmak insanı tanrı tanımazlığa götürür mü? Kısaca aslında bir önceki soruya cevabın benzer olduğunu, pardon, bu sorunun da bir önceki soruya benzer olduğunu hatırlattı. Açık ki pek çok sayıda din adamı var, evrim konusunda hiçbir sorunu olmayan, dolayısıyla arada çözülmez bir çelişki var denemez ama şu da bir gerçek dedi, sonuçta evrim kuramı karmaşık fenotipleri, aynı zamanda beyin davranışlar gibi son derece karmaşık insan için önemli olguları, olgulara dair çok güzel bir açıklama sunuyor. Ve bu da ulu, ulu bir güç, metafizik bir gücün varlığına ihtiyaç bırakmıyor. 
e, tasarım e, dedi başta değildi. E, tasarımın her çok zaman içinde e, evrildiğini ve kendimizle beraber geldiğini görüyoruz diye e, duyurum yaptı. Eğer yine bir eksik bıraktıysam. Tamam, e, Wayne Rojan e, şarkılarına güvenerek Evrim Tanrı ile e, çelişmekte e, demiş. Ee, sağ olun. Ee, teknik sorunlar için de kusura bakmayın tekrar. Yes, 
children that have learned to interpret the Bible in a way which does not in any way negate the teaching of science. It is important Muslim thinkers perform the same service. That's the end of the quote from Bumbola. It is indeed true that senior Christian churchmen and theologians accept evolution and in many cases actively support scientists in this respect. The Archbishop of Canterbury is 